I'm Tim Ellis. Thanks for joining us for Langway Live. You may know tonight's guest as the host of Blockbuster or Total Recall. Or you may have seen him performing his amazing mentalism at Slight Night or the Melbourne Magic Festival. Please welcome Michael Pope. Goodness me, what an accolade that's far, far greater than I've ever received before. And let's hope it wasn't just one hand clapping. Hey, Tim, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Now, where are you? I, I don't recognise that location. Uh, well, because you've never been invited to my house, and that's probably the way it's going to stay. Um, I'm in my home office um, in my home, which is Very in uh, sunny Mel Melbourne, Australia. Uh, which part of the world are you calling from? <laughs> you've been here before. <laughs> True. <laughs> you've what I'm thinking of doing, house. what I'm thinking of doing, is turning this room into kind of a I don't know, sort of a small intimate theatre space with maybe three chairs and, uh, and do close-up magic here. Do you think that would catch on? I think, you, I think as long as you can space the chairs out uh, with at least a <laughs> metre and a half between each other, it'll be perfect. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And, and, and just have the chairs. I don't think the performer needs to be in this space. Uh, just have a nice audience feel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, three people who are living together and you can... <laughs> You can just pop in via Zoom. Hey, we've got something going on now. This is good. It's a good idea. Well, this is, this is the thing. You've been doing TV for so long. The medium of so TV. Long. For so long. I'll say that again. So long. Since, since John Logie Baird was a boy. <laughs> <laughs> you bastard. 1984 is the word you're using, looking for. 1984. Right. Big brother. I was, uh, here's Humphrey was the, uh, the start of it all. I grew up in Adelaide. And uh, not much was getting made in Adelaide at the time. It was either the Ernie Sigley show or uh, Humphrey. And um, so that was my first um, uh, TV experience. You know other magicians who were on here, Humphrey? Uh, the marvellous... Um, oh, uh, uh, mime. Um, Raymond Crowe. Oh, yeah, of course, Raymond Crowe. That's not who I was thinking of. Um, yeah, fabulous Raymond Crowe. Uh, I didn't know he was on here, Humphrey. He was. Was he... Was he was he a presenter or just kind of a guest uh, performer? Well, unless, my, unless I dreamt it, he was a presenter because I have not been able to find any photographic or video evidence of it. Do you often dream of Raymond Crowe? I dream of Hughes Humphrey a lot. <laughs> um, I'll edit that. Oh, this, <laughs> this, this is embarrassing. Um, a terrific um, uh, performer and producer, uh, theatre, um, Kissing Frogs, um, mm, Patsy Bith. Glenn Nicholas. Yes. Glenn Nicholas, I'm sure, uh, well, is, is another Adelaide ex-performer, um, magician, and uh, he may well have been on Here's Humphrey. Yes, I wasn't in the suit of Here's Humphrey, I have to stress. I was a presenter with him. I was never inside his... I was, <clears throat> I was never inside Humphrey. There was a party once, but, um, you but know. So you on Here's Humphrey as a pre presenter, I was going to say a preventer, but a presenter, amazing. Was that, that was your first break in, in TV? It was uh, in 1984. I finished drama school at Flinders Uni in 82, two, three, something like that. Um, and uh, sorry, I, I correct myself. That was the first presenting I did on TV as myself. Around that time um, in 83, four, I was doing um, a character called Albert Nuss. Good eye, how are you? It was uh, very Uncle Albert. Uh, our uncle, uh, Glenn, um, Glenn, Glenn, <laughs> oh, my brain of names. It's, it's the virus. What happens isolated too long? It's the virus. Diarrhea and memory loss, I believe, are the two biggest issues. Um, and I only have one of them. Uh, it, clearly, it's the memory loss. What I'm saying is, straight out of uni, I got a role on Sarah Dane as an actor, because I trained as an actor. Uh, and Sarah Dane was a miniseries, again, shot in Adelaide. Um, but, uh, but that was happening. And then I presented a character that I developed at drama school called Uncle Albert, Mr. Albert Nuss. And when I started doing stand-up comedy, um, it was Mr. A. Nuss. And uh, he had a wig. <laughs> yes, don't nod your head, Tim. He had a wig and a, a pot belly and glasses and buck teeth and so on. And Tim, as a performer, you'd understand this. My first stand-up comedy work was as a character rather than myself. 
um, because I just come from acting school and all I wanted to be was an actor, you know, be other characters, not Michael Pope, but other characters. And so I developed this, this uh, comic character that I was doing in the stand up comedy rooms of, of Sydney where I moved to and, and this and that. So then when I got this job on Here's Humphrey, it was, it was confronting. It's like myself, like me present, oh, that's scary. So I thought, now what, what I know, I'll be on Here's Humphrey playing the role of a presenter on a kid's show called Here's Humphrey. And so I maintained that sort of mask, the actor's mask and so on. Until then, in 85, I got a job on Channel 7 Sydney called The Card and Connection, where it was seven days a week, live to air, and, and th this, this uh, facade of it's not me fairly quickly dropped and just the real me came out, which, which disturbingly wasn't far from the, car the character that I was doing as a stand-up comedian. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, you've got to be bigger than life for cartoons. Yeah, indeed. Indeed, I was. And, and so now as a cut 30 years uh, or longer, uh, now whether I'm, I'm presenting, you know, a show in, in a magic or, or in front of an audience at a TV show or in the corporate world with a, you know, tuxedo on, um, pretty much it's, it's me, you know, to the square of nine or something, to the well, nth degree for that. Well, for the people who, who don't know you from the magic scene, uh, you have indulged in a lot of mentalism and you've got very very good at it and i'd like to just show a quick clip of michael pope in action doing some mental can i try something with yes you please do are you a good poker face like you know keep it to yourself sort oh, of thing? I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if i am but i can give it a go okay what i have here is a, a dice or a die in, in a, uh, a container mm -hmm. what i want you to do is roll that die mix it all up okay. mix it all up turn it upside down the whole bit Put it down on the table, you look right. at it, but don't let, put, take it away a little bit more. Okay, so right. Look at you, but not. Can I do this? It's okay. silk. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Right. And, and you've got there. You know what the dice is now. Mm -hmm. You can come back on mine now. Mm -hmm. I want okay. you to concentrate. Um, I want you to concentrate on the number of that dice. And I want you to say the numbers from one to six equally, oh. slowly. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. of course, one of them is you're going to try and protect one of them. Okay, yeah, And no, listeners you're right. should be able to pick up which one he's, let's say, lying. Oh, lying. no. Okay. Uh, one, two, Three, four, five, six. Again, a little faster. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six. Damn you! Yeah, okay. Damn you, Pope! It's it's about <laughs> you, you trying to hide it, which is understand. It. And so what you did is threw away the number six. Uh, you were like you were trying to misguide me on the two, weren't you? <laughs> One, two, pause. Three, four, five, six. Any yeah, you yeah, this is quite right. spooky. Okay. Like, because when you were doing that, I I. I mentally pictured six. That's, That's great. You yeah, have a I connection. You might, two, you might be magic. You. Uh, Eddie, you do it. You, you, you try. How many meetings have you been where you've had to hold your tongue? And no, I don't that do that. <laughs> okay, you mix it up. Put right. it down. Okay. Look at it now. Give me your hand, if you will. Oh. Just put oh. your hand out. Just put the palm oh. down. Okay, now again, I'll, I, I'm this time going okay. to say the numbers, mm -hmm. and I just want you to say no each and every time. Okay? okay. okay. Concentrate. One. No. Two. No. Three. No. Four. No. Five. No. Six. No. Four. One more time. Three. No. Six. No. I go four. Correct. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> Oh! What I was doing there was oh! pressing on Eddie's hand uh, just just oh. slightly, and yeah. when you lie, you tense up. And so there's a tip: if you're having a discussion with someone and you feel that they're lying, try and touch their muscles. And if they stick yeah. it in your hand, then you're either doing something very inappropriate or that they're lying. So that's what boys do when they've got you by the throat. That's right. They're just, <laughs> it's only about feeling the pulse. That's right. <laughs> Oh, that's what it is. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, wow. yeah. That's very good. Okay, yeah, I must admit, I'm just turning the, the mm. die over there. They've all got four on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, you that's do one more because there's oh, a real okay. kicker. Yeah, okay. we like this one. Now we're, we're playing. Okay. Who's better? Go, right, go, go, go. You do it. Okay, okay, okay. Mix it up. I'm really mixing it up. I'm going to get you this time, Pope. You're not going to get me up. Is that right? Yeah. It's down? Yes, it's down. You've got one? Yeah, I've got one. Concentrate. I'm concentrating. Can you turn side on a little bit? I can. Okay, just stop there. There? One. You say no. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Three. Then. One. No. Two. No. Three. No. Four. No. Five. No. Six. No. Yeah. When you lie, you tighten your ass a little bit. <laughs> you, side on. Yeah. you got the number two, yeah? Damn you! Yeah! <laughs> Damn you! Look at that! Number two! Oh, there you go. Wow! Right, then, Pappy, you should. What are you doing?
that was fun to do. Very fun to do. And uh, the boys were very uh, uh, good to go with it all. It was great. Yes. That, yeah, now you've done, I think, that effect here at Slight Night, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Slight Night's are fantastic. Uh, if, if you're watching, you don't know what Slight Night is, then, then find out. And I'm sure Tim's told you many times, but it's a, a great, really nice uh, event to look at, to be a, an audience member of, let alone doing it. Um, yeah, the mentalism, I'm, a, I'm drawn to mentalism because I can use it in my corporate work. If you don't know, I spend most of my time these days, uh, well, when it's alive, in the event industry, um, emceeing conferences or hosting award nights and so forth. And so there's an expectation that, that magic coming into that space, unless you're billed as a guest magician, is a bit odd for an MC. But the way I, I dovetail it in is by starting with the premise that, you know, to get the best out of these next three days, we really need to be on the same page. Let's put that to the test now. And so I do a, you know, um, let's all think of a vegetable, carrot, that kind of thing uh, as a segue in. And so once I set that scene very early on, then when we come back after, you know, lunch break and so forth, it's not odd that I now bring out perhaps more magic skewed, but still in that area of, I, I, I can get into your heads here. Are we still on the same page kind of thing? And it's been great fun, as you know, as a yeah. performer. And, and who was your, your main mentalism influence? Well, I was late to the art. Um, Darren Brown, of course, like is in another league. I mean, his, his one hour TV shows, what he does, obviously with a budget, but, but what he does and pulls off is amazing. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I um, remember seeing Lawrence Long for the first time about three years ago at the, at your festival and uh, was blown away and re-enthused about it because it started for me when I was about 13, 14. Again, in Adelaide, there was a magic society, a magic club, I think it was. Um, and if anyone watching from Adelaide, it was in Theberton in an air raid shelter. Do you know of it, Tim? It still is. Oh, I haven't been down Port Road for a long time. Uh, South Road, I should say. South Road um, for a long time. I thought it'd be knocked down, but that's great as, that it's still there. Yeah, as soon as this pandemic is over, you're straight on to visit them. No, I'm not. It was scary then, and it probably still is. But that's where I um, kind of had that first exposure to, to adult magicians doing it. And my first ever, in case you don't ask me, my first ever sort of experience with magic and an audience thing was this magician, I forgive me, I don't remember his name, and uh, he's probably still alive because I was 14 and he was, I think, mid-20s. Um, he did a, a live gig and used me as a, well, as a stooge, but it could have been anyone in the head guillotine thing as in, Hey, here's someone out of the audience, come forward, put your head in a guillotine. And I still, when I talk about it now, I can still remember the room to a degree and that idea of putting in there. And while at that age, he didn't tell me how it's done. I have, I had confidence that it was going to be okay, but, but I can remember that part palpitating what if this goes wrong kind of thing? I haven't told mum that I was at this gig, like they'll never find me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, magicians, they make things disappear and so on. But, but that has stuck with me, that feeling of being the participant in a magician's act and, and that oh, has really informed the way then I handle um, people that I get up on stage with. I don't go anywhere near that scary life thing. In fact, I do a, um, um, a, a roulette uh, nail gun thing. And when I first did it, I was doing it on other people. And then I went back into that space and I have much more fun of making me the person who might get a stable gun to the cheek or to the heart or the throat or something. Um, and it stems from that first experience uh, being a, a magician's um, foil. It's, it's a, a very interesting perception there because a lot of magicians have not gone through that and, and often they're chosen for, to be a volunteer and you know, choose a card, choose a card. But if you're brought on stage and you're made to sweat in a way that is both, you know, exciting, but also really uncomfortable, you'll never yeah. do it to anyone else. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Now, you, um, uh, you, you did do a lot of uh, other sorts of magic before mentalism, because I know that when you were doing warm up, we would often discuss different tricks. I think there was one, the one with the phone with the big magnet that would, uh, you know, turn <laughs> off your phone. Soon, I've got your magnet, you know, all that sort of stuff. Because you, you've done warm up on a lot of Australian TV shows, including Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, uh, talking about your generation, Dancing with the Stars, 
uh, AGT, the Logies, all sorts of different shows you've done warm up on and you incorporated magic in that. Yeah, I think that's what re brought it back into my life uh, about 15, 20 years ago. I've been doing that role for about 30 years, since 1990 actually. Um, from, and the first ones were Blind Date and um, Acropolis Now and, and all these classic 90s shows. Um, and Mad as Hell is the, perhaps the most current one that I still do. And why I brought it back is that in that role of, of um, a performer in that space of warm up, unlike doing the kind of performances where you do where, ladies and gentlemen, Tim Ellis, and you know you've got their attention for 45 minutes or seven minutes or an hour and a half, let's have a break, you know, kind of thing. In warm up, I could be on for 30 seconds or three minutes or 13 minutes. And I don't know at the start of that time how long that is for. So it's hard to, um, so, so what I don't do is create a show uh, that, you know, does a nice 20 minutes and so on and so forth with a build. So I had to come up with a lot of quick things that with my, if, if I know anything I'm good at, it isn't magic, it is filling time. Um, and so I can have a, a 30 second bit of shtick that I can stretch to three minutes um, without any trouble. And so you mentioned this, this magnet thing that's, so cute that you remember that. I, it must be one of the first times that we, you know, chatted. Um, it, it, it is a magnet thing that has a a uh, phone, which I, you know, it's not handy. I've still got it though, but I don't use it because the phone is. You don't need to explain the secrets. Oh, okay. <laughs> Say nothing. It's it's a magnet that attracts phones. That's right. It's amazing, <laughs> and it's true. Um, yes, yes. So so uh, doing the warm up and having that need to fill time made me revisit that joy that I had as a kid. And yes, yeah, started with more proppy kind of things. And I still do it in warm up. But um, again, with mentalism, it's, as you know, it's, it's about setting a scene in an environment which takes some time. And so I'm loath to do that. So now I tend to just cut to the chase with, with routines or, or, or bits of business that if I had a, a very captive, my audience, I might stretch into a, a, a more, you know, more of a journey that, that you do so well, Tim. Well, you did it last year at the Melbourne Magic Festival. I think it was your first debut solo mentalism show. I'm, I'm sorry, wasn't, was that the one that I got the award for? I don't recall any awards. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. I'm sure you voted for me. Best Newcomer Award. Yeah, I was so um... chuffed because I think I was the oldest performer in the, the festival. But, uh, but because it was my debut to the festival, I was eligible to get yeah. Best Newcomer Award. And, uh, and it was great and enthused me to, to, you know, put my hand up again for the next festival and so on and so forth. So, yeah, that was great fun. Which, unfortunately, has been cancelled. And I, mm. I assume all your warm-up work and your TV work has been uh, put on hold as well. What, what's that? JobKeeper? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. No, so, every, so everything's you, you and the rest of the television industry... <laughs> Lining up television and, and live performers and the whole lot. No, it's, it's very dire. Um, I'm, I'm uh, in a good, perhaps better position than some because I've been a company for many years. And so my company is eligible to get some money, JobKeeper, that then pays me as an individual. I feel for those people who need to bounce over to JobSeeker um, because it's, it's much more of a hurdle, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, the, the events industry, which has been my bread and butter for so long, um, has really dried up. But the joy is that uh, I'm getting online very quickly and um, not using false names that I used to and uh, becoming, uh, becoming uh, you, you probably have a filter on your, <laughs> on your network, Tim, you may not be familiar with my other work. Um, I have, I'm getting very uh, good and, ha and I have clients, existing clients, and I'll be seeking more to use me as their anchor for uh, online meetings and conferences. Fantastic. So I'll be, yeah. so I'm pursuing that and, and some work's coming in, which is great. Oh, that's really good. That's really good. The, uh, of course, you uh, don't just do the conferences and things, but you've also produced a lot of shows. I can remember a few years ago because you produced um, Family Feud and also The Price is Right and you had me uh, <laughs> making a little weird cameo appearances on the prizes right probably the strangest magic shows i've ever done <laughs> is that right gee it would have been a challenge for you because you had i think 15 seconds um and we probably stretched it to 30 because there was a live entertainer in the space <laughs> yes. but yeah that was that was great fun with the wonderful larry emder um 
and you yes i remember vividly as the door opens yeah. as we look at the fridge that we're trying to flog and the guy has to guess what the cost of the fridge is uh, somehow you made that fridge entertaining and, and you probably opened the freezer and pulled out a live dove or, or whatever. Um, I, yes. I, I, I've got like such vague memories of that time, but it was, it was very challenging to sort of do a magic show in about 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was great fun. And I've also over my years um, uh, directed theater as well. That, that, that um, um, working in a team and that collaborative feeling of, of what can we together create is, is great fun. And it's something I miss as a solo performer. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. And, and part of the joy, I did put my hand up with Kath uh, Jamison to do the magic festival this year as a double act with Kath um, that's on hold. And I'm sure we will partner up next year um, when you're back better than ever. Yeah. You've also uh, done, because I know Kath also did AGT, Australia's Got Talent, and you at some point were a producer on that show. Not, not a producer as in producing the show, but uh, I, I'm not quite sure what the exact title is, but you were seeking out acts to try and, uh, yeah. them and get them on the show. That's right. That's right. I was um, associate producer, I think was the okay. technical title. But yeah, my role was to, uh, I was scouring the country for acts. This was series two that I was involved in. Series one, naming no names, but I, I feel was mishandled a bit in terms of burning some people, which was not good for, for anyone, the individuals or the industry or the show. Um, it, and so I came... More of, more of a negative sort of feel for the judging, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, this was um, what it, what it was. The, Australia's Got Talent is the Australian version of whoever's got talent, yeah. and you buy that concept. And that concept involves performers doing their thing, and then a getting edited a lot, and then b possibly not even appearing, or c appearing in a very tokenistic way, um, and so on after the event. So you as a performer might come on and go, but dang, I was fabulous. The crowd was awesome. And the judges were so nice and so on. However, the way you appear on TV is in the lap of the gods in the hands of someone else. And, and that wasn't explained very well because it was new in series one. A lot of performers uh, felt hard done by not so much what the judges said about them, except there were some moments. Um, it's just the whole way they were presented. Um, and, and that, I think, was poorly communicated to them at the start of that whole process. Series two, I think we got it a bit better, and I, I feel now that they're getting much better at it. And um, uh, you'll be able to rattle off more than me uh, the names of, of Australians who are making it on the global stage in that format, uh, doing great things. Yeah. What, what, were, were there any magicians you were able to tempt onto the show in series two? No. Uh, no, no is a short answer. I'm pausing, thinking I'm not sure. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think there was, as you said, a very negative feel about it at that point, because I think a lot of people who went on series one were just like, they'd watch the episode and go, what? They, but, and, and they'd be presented as though the judges said no or something like that when it yeah. actually quite well. So I think yeah. it was very hard to get magicians onto the show. And even, even into the later series, uh, there were, I always get the calls from the producers saying, you know, hey, can we get some, some entertainers on? Every year they say the same thing. They say, we, we know that in the past it's been very negative, but we've changed. We've changed. And then when I said this, I'm like, you haven't changed that much. Yeah. Yeah, because that is the show, unfortunately. Um, uh, and and yeah. it's good for some acts. Some acts go through and they, they get presented beautifully and others... Uh, it's almost like they're used as sort of fodder, as you say, token tokens. Um, but uh, it's hard to know whether you're going to, you know, hit the right lucky number and be chosen yeah. by the, the, the God producers who just go, okay, you're going to go all the way. That's right. That's right. And, and, and I'd like your, to hear your thoughts on this magic. Most magic I, I feel needs a beginning, middle and an end. And yes, you can do it in 15 seconds like you did on The Price is Right. But you kind of, unless, unless you make it for 15 seconds, if you do a three minute act, beginning, middle and end, to, to cut that out and, and leave out one of those elements yeah. is tragic. With all respect to a dancer, three minutes of dancing, you've kind of seen it in 15 seconds and I'm sure you're going to do more of the same. And even a singer. Yeah, I know that song and it builds beautifully. And oh, we never heard the last few bars, but we kind of, we got that act. Whereas a, a, it's like a, a, you know, a storyteller coming out and telling, you know, Little Red Riding Hood, 
but you never hear about when the wolf, you know, did its business or you suddenly cut to a, a scene where a, a, a wolf dressed as a grandmother is, is running around a bed. Like why I'm not engaged with that event because I never knew about little red riding hood. So uh, that idea of cutting a story up and presenting it just as fodder, just like a, here's 15 seconds of a dancer. You could live with that, but a magician, I think, or a storyteller uh, needs that arc. I think you're right. There, there's, there, it has worked in favour for some acts. Like, for example, if you're doing a, a mentalism act and a lot of the, the act involves pre-show where you're asking people, could you do this? Could you do this? Could you do this? And then you're like, okay, and now you're thinking of this, bang. And if they, they, they look at it as, a, as editors and they don't understand magic, so they go, all that bit at the start's very boring. We'll just cut that out. Yeah. And you end up doing a miracle. And people are like, what? Yes. How did they yeah. So it can work in their favour, but I recall the, there was talk about, oh, could you come and do the soaring in half or the trunk, you know, the Houdini trunk illusion? I'm like, well, I can, but they're like six minute routines. Oh, mm. can you do them quicker? Not really. And so I'd say, okay, we'll edit them down. I was like, I don't think I want to take a chance yeah. that I'm going to be edited in a really weird way and it's, it's just not going to work. So yeah, it's, it, right. it is interesting, but you get other acts like Cosentino, who created of course yeah, goodness he, me he created acts he, specifically for the show uh and yeah. the gentleman of deceit and of course uh recently in america's got talent with dom chambers who again yeah. is creating acts specifically for that medium and i think you really have you can't just say oh i'll do the regular show i do you know you you would you mm. wouldn't go on and do a book test that you normally do for 20 minutes or something like that. You know, you mm. just, no, mm. I'm gonna to have to create something specifically for AGT. So it's interesting um, that the, I, th I don't think the ratings were fantastic last year, but they, uh, they do intend to come back again this year at some point. They do, so, it, did, uh, it did surprise me, yeah. Yeah, we'll see what happens, see if any magicians take it on again. <laughs> <laughs> I do find it odd. I think it's fantastic that Dom has got a spot on the America's Got Talent. Mm. Now, does he have a, American passport or lifeline well, happened, or anything? What happened was um, they saw him on Fool Us because they're, they're, the Americans have got talents pretty much using Fool Us as their audition period for magicians. So when right. they see an interesting act on, on uh, Fool Us who they haven't seen before, they just call them up and say, hey, do you want to do America's Got Talent? doesn't matter where they're from in the world. They just put them on and uh, yeah. they think it's going to work. And of course, Dom, you know, hey, he's, he's really developed a really unique brand, a really unique selling point. And, and so his mm. character is so different and his style is so different. It stands out and really reaches mm. a new audience, which is great. Yeah. My, my, where I was heading was nothing gets Dom the individual. It's just the franchise calling itself a location has talent and then basically getting anyone from around the world to be on it. Yep. But that same thing happened on the last season of Australia's Got Talent. There were yeah. about five acts who were not even residents. They were just brought in. And, yeah. uh, and, and people were sorry, because I think one or two of them got into the grand final and people were like, what, what's yeah. this guy? He's not, even, he's not even from Australia. So yeah, yeah it, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's, yeah. If, if I was the you know, executive producer, I'd be finding hard to go, no, Australia's Got Talent. And then the counter argument is, well, you haven't found the talent that equals what we have overseas. And I would somehow spin it and go, that may or may not be true, but to keep the purity of the brand, we will showcase our talent and we will work with them and, you know, shoot them from different angles to just make them the best that they can be. And if that is that, then that is that. Um, and let the viewers then go over and watch something else. Britain's got talent or America's got talent and Japan's got talent. Um, and let them decide rather than, mm. you know, presenting them in any other way. Well, sadly, uh, Britain's Got Talent, which was airing on Foxtel, I think, got bigger ratings than Australia's Got Talent this year, which is wow. uh, a bit scary. And, and Britain's Got Talent was uh, uh, about six months or a year behind anyway. But the, yeah. uh, I think the biggest problem this year uh, from all the feedback I read in the, the rags was that uh, it was so focused on the judges and not on the act. <laughs> Right, uh, and so there was probably I think someone calculated there was like, in in any given act there was maybe thirty percent of the cutaways were were to the judges, uh, yeah. and only seventy percent of the the time was spent filming the actual act. Yeah, yeah, I remember when the the franchise first came to Australia, it was a common complaint about that show. Going, did you see that show last night? they introduce this act and you're watching it and then they suddenly cut to the host in the, in the wings and, and then cutaways to the judges. And so I just want to see the act. 
it was quite new. I mean, yeah. go back to the Don Lane day, oh, yeah. Don Lane show or new faces with Bert. Um, yeah. You would never interrupt an act and, and cut away. Yeah. Um, so it was taking an education. Now we could talk about why they did that. Um, partly I think for the editing so that they could cut a three minute or even a 90 second act down to 45 and it could look unedited. Yeah. Um, but also I think it's about building the brand of those individual judges and Absolutely. creating a different offering beyond just a talent show. Mm. It, it is. It is absolutely that. Um, it's, uh, there's, we, we can chat for hours just about this, but I think the bottom line is you just need to get in there as the executive producer and fix it. And then uh, indeed, then all the magicians will come on the show. <laughs> That's right. I'll ring someone important right now. Where's my phone? Well, the, you, I mean, you, you've not only been, been uh, you know, a, a producer behind the scene, but you've also been a host with Blockbusters and Total Recall. So, you, you know, you're, you're like the face of television, both front and backstage. There it is, right there. there. there, is, there is face. <laughs> so I've got to ask you, being the TV guy, yes. what are you watching on Netflix? Um, I just, the other night, started series three, is it, or two? Ozark. Um, oh, yes. Have you you like Ozark? I have watched all of Ozark, and I'm waiting for more. <laughs> uh, well, I haven't seen all the latest series, but uh, I think Jason Bateman isn't Jason Bateman wonderful that he can go from um, uh, <sighs> my memory to the virus, um, Arrested Development, yes, um, to Ozark, and he kind of plays the same character. <laughs> but, I mean, whether he. Whether he's trying to get his son out of some trouble in Arrested yeah. Development or he's arranging for a hit and, yeah. you know, a billion dollar fraud, um, he's, he's kind of still, it's the same act. But, and you accept him comfortably in a comedic role or, or uh, you know, in, in this other one. Um, but Ozark I'm watching and have just started on um, Free to Air, uh, Killing Eve. All right. Now, for a few friends of mine, really love Killing Eve. They, they think it's great. Um, I have to say, you, have you watched The Tiger King yet? <laughs> no, my daughter is watching it. I'm getting updates about it. It sounds scary. I have a, a an anti-cruelty to animal thing. So kind of by right, I don't want to seem to be supporting anyone who treats their animals like that. But I, I asked her and I said, how do they treat their animals? And she said, well, for a caged animal, they treat them really well. So, you know, maybe maybe I should. It's It's, it's like watching a car crash in slow motion. Every episode just gets more bizarre than the previous one. So yeah, Tiger right. King is definitely worth a watch. And the other one I want to tip, um, I've just started watching this and I didn't realize there were so many episodes, Money Heist. Uh, don't know that. Money Heist is a Spanish TV series and it's, yep. it's like a telenova um, set during a bank heist. Okay. Which is just, it, it's, just gets crazier and crazier and it's addictive viewing. So I just started watching. I thought I'll just fill in a bit of time between uh, filling these episodes, but now I'm like, Oh no, I've just seen that there's four seasons. There's about 12 episodes in every season. Right. Uh, That's a lot. Them all now. I'm going to have to watch them all. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, can I ask you a question and uh, we can make it as short as long as you want. I've got my thoughts, but I want to hear yours first. Um, back to, to magic, the core of why we're all here. What is magic as by, defined by Tim Ellis? Magic is something perceived in the audience's eyes. So I can sit here and learn sleight of hand. I can do all sorts of fancy things where things vanish, and, but it's not going to look like magic unless the audience member believes it's magic. If I take a ball and make it disappear, the audience is not gonna say, oh, it really disappeared. They're gonna say he just got rid of it really quickly somehow unless I've convinced to them in the first place that it's gone because of magic. And I have to explain to them, mm. you know, as you said, that question, what is magic? And it, 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 everyone has their own perception of what magic is. So mm. if I can convince them that what I'm doing aligns with their perception of magic, then we have a nice synchronicity and, and they believe it. But otherwise you know, you've, you've done the same thing. You've practiced in front of the mirror, you've watched yourself yeah. on video and you've gone, Oh, that's not going to fool anyone. <laughs> when you and create it, it the does. right environment and you create the right atmosphere and you suggest this is what's going to happen. It's like you said before, when, when, when you go into a corporate event and you do magic and they're not expecting it, you haven't set up the scene, you haven't done that, but by gradually lulling them into it, 
you can create yeah. the atmosphere of yeah. magic and thus they will then believe what you're doing is magic. That's my definition anyway. You say, I've got a shorter one, uh, which is <laughs> magic is what's left when all the other explanations have been eradicated. <laughs> well, that, um, is that is true. You know, as, as cavemen, we grow up going, you know, what's that big fireball up in the sky? It, it's magic. It's magic. And then science tells us, no, it's the sun and the and rotation and all of that. And so if you show me something and I can go, well, I reckon he just dropped that ball. Um, and he hasn't shown me that he didn't drop that ball. Yeah. Then I will always believe you just dropped the ball. But if I go, well, he didn't drop the ball because I saw him in full shot and it's not on the ground. Yeah. And these other seven things I reckon he did are unexplained or can be explained not to be the case, then I don't know. Magic is the answer. But it's fascinating because it's different to everybody. For a lot of people, they look at the coronavirus and they understand it is science and it's to do the genomes. Um, but other people who shall remain nameless think it is magic and it's just going to disappear in April. Yeah. Do you think he's going to get re-elected? Oh, who? I wasn't talking about anyone in particular. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, uh, our great uh, red-headed friend from across the waters, but that's, that's another podcast altogether. It is. It is where we're sort of just speaking about important things on this, like magic, yeah, but I, I, I want to say thank you so much for chatting. We have run out of time terribly, but I, it's been a delight chatting with you. Uh, where can people find you online? <laughs> Um, thank you, Tim, very much for having me. Um, you can find me if you have any need for amusement um, or a glue in the sandwich or, um, you know, meat and potato. No, whatever, you know what I mean. As a host, as an MC, you can find me at www.michaelpope.com.au. Thanks, Tim. It's uh, always a pleasure when we meet up live or in this virtual space. Uh, it's been great. Thank you for your um, attention to me. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Welcome once again to Blockbusters, to day two, to a contest of skill, strategy, general knowledge, and a lot of fun and excitement along the way. Every week on Blockbusters, we follow two schools through the week. And if you missed us yesterday, here are the schools again. Thanks, Gary.